Now celebrating 22 and a half years of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1172 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Beauvais Island de-expeditioners are in the planning stages for de-expeditions on 2021, 2022, and 2023 to Beauvais Island. Meanwhile, the Intrepid DX group takes itself out of the running to activate Beauvais Island. The July Volunteer Monitor Program report is released. We'll have all the details. The QSO Virtual Ham Exposition is now underway. Amateurs are taking the final lap by wrapping up the W9 IMS Indianapolis Speedway special event. California amateurs provide communications and support during the deadly Dixie wildfire. Bob Ringwald, K6YBK, the Jazz Ambassador, and journalist, archivist, and broadcaster Wolf Harris, OE1WHC, both become a silent key. We'll have all the details. There's a group that is flying up to Alaska to activate parks on the air from Alaska, and that operation begins this week. We'll tell you all about that. And a pioneer New England broadcaster celebrates 100 years on the air. We will tell you all about the celebration in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be talking about podcasts. The amateur radio community has hundreds of available podcasts, so Leo will be answering the questions, what is a podcast and exactly how do you subscribe to them? Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be talking about all of the things that aren't amateur radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to the beginning, before vacuum tubes, before spectrum regulation, all the way back to the early days of Spark. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the best ways to seal coax connectors on your antenna installation. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in a very nondescript building in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where we're finally getting out of this 90-degree heat wave, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our Troy, New York news bureau, where I'm beginning to long for the temperatures of October, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our amateur radio station, Atop Sand Hill in the beautiful Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the tropical conditions and thunderstorms continue even more. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we are again dealing with Thor's hammer, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. We have a late breaking story as we come to air this week. In a statement received by the ARRL this morning on August 14th, 2021, Region 2 of the International Amateur Radio Union has requested that radio amateurs in the Americas keep the following frequencies clear to support emergency communications in Haiti following an earthquake that happened this morning. 3.750, 7.150, and 14.330 kHz. The statement came from IARU Region 2 Emergency Coordinator Carlos Alberta Santa Maria Gonzalez, CO2JC. According to preliminary information from the United States Geological Survey, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck Haiti this morning at 1229 UTC, about 12 kilometers northeast of St. Louis de Sud, and 33 kilometers to the east-northeast of Las Cayas. 
That is 18.352 degrees north and 73.4801 degrees west at a depth of 10 kilometers. Mr. Gene Robert Gilliard, HH2JR, president of the Radio Club of Haiti, reported significant structural damage, and international news reports fear there may be high casualties. Once again, the frequencies that Haiti requested to remain clear here in the Americas is 3.750, 7.150, and 14.330 kilohertz. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off this week's news, parallel planning is underway by three entities for de-expeditions to Bouvet Island in 2021, 2022, and 2023. The remote volcanic glacial sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic is the second most wanted DXCC entity, according to Clublog. In June, the Intrepid DX Group canceled its 3Y0J de-expedition, planned for 2023, after the RV Braveheart was put up for sale. Not long after, the Intrepid DX Group revived its plans and was seeking a suitable vessel. On August 8th, a de-expedition using the 3Y0J callsign announced the signing of a contract with the expedition vessel Marama, a 101-foot sailing catch with a proven track record and experienced polar crew. Co-leaders for the November 2022 effort are Ken Upskar, LA7GIA, Rune Uy, LA7THA, and Erin Marin, LB1QI. Upscar, who holds the 3Y0J license, split from the Intrepid DX Group de-expedition effort he headed with co-leader Paul Ewing, N6PSE. In a brief announcement on August 3rd, Ewing said that a Bove de-expedition team under revised leadership had found a suitable and affordable vessel willing to take us to Bove and was negotiating the terms of that charter contract. Ewing's co-leaders would be David Jorgensen, WD5COV, and Kevin Rowett, K6TD. The Intrepid DX Group now must secure a new license and landing permission from the Norwegian Polar Institute. In a brief statement released on Friday, August 13th, Intrepid DX Group President Paul Ewing, N6PSE, said his team is pulling out of the race to activate Bouvet Island and looking elsewhere. We now find ourselves the number three team in line to go to Bouvet, the announcement said. The recent development is not comfortable for us, so we're now re-examining the top 10 most wanted DXCC entities with a plan to redirect our efforts to an activation that will be most beneficial for everyone. We plan to activate a different rare and much needed entity in January slash February 2023. That is now our focus. Watch for more updates on this exciting new project. We wish our former 3Y0J teammates a safe and productive journey to Bouvet. Meanwhile, Polish radio amateur Dom Jib, 3Z9DX, says planning continues for a second expedition on Bouvet Island in late 2021, using the call sign 3Y01. As you probably know, our first attempt to reach the island of Bouvet in March 2019 failed, Jib said on D-Expedition's website. We were so close, just 63 nautical miles off the shore of Bouvet Island. The reconstituted 3Y0J group under the LA7GIA slash LA7THA slash LB1QI triumvirate said in its August 8th announcement that it planned to begin fundraising immediately. It would field a team of 12 operators for a 20-day stay around Bouvet. They would set up at Cape Phi in the southeastern part of the island, which is called the only feasible part where a de-expedition can safely set up camp on rocky ground. We will not set up camp on the glacier. With thanks to Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, we bring you the July 2021 Activity Report of the Volunteer Monitor Program. This program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance operating rule compliance in the amateur radio service. Here with more details on the July Volunteer Monitor Program is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Technician class licensees in California, New York, Idaho, and Texas received advisory notices concerning FT8 operation on frequencies not authorized to technician licensees. General class licensees in Florida and Maryland received advisory notices for operation in the amateur extra portion of 20 meters. A licensee in Arizona received an advisory notice concerning failure to abide by a request to stay off a particular repeater. The matter will be referred to the FCC for enforcement action. 
A general class licensee in Georgia received an advisory notice concerning failure to identify properly and for repeated communications with unlicensed stations on 75 meters. An amateur extra class licensee in New Jersey received an advisory notice concerning on-the-air threats directed at another operator, also on 75 meters. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The final totals for the Volunteer Monitor Program monitoring in July were 1,736 hours on HF frequencies and 2,185 hours on VHF and UHF frequencies. The IT staff at ARRL headquarters has begun work on the automated system for volunteer monitors to report monthly monitoring hours and incident reports. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is this weekend, August 14th and 15th. You can register and visit the ARRL booth to connect with ARRL staff representatives in the video lounges on Saturday from 1500 to 2300 UTC and Sunday from 1500 to 1800 UTC. There will be in-booth drawings and special offers for ARRL online store and for joining or renewing membership. On Sunday at 1500 UTC, that's 8 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time and 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, will present how to comply with FCC RF exposure rules in the virtual auditorium. Amateur radio has had rules regulating RF exposure for decades, Hare explains. The FCC recently announced changes to those rules that change the ways that all radio services determine whether they need to do an evaluation of RF exposure or are exempt from that need. I put together this presentation to explain the rules, the changes, and to answer the most common questions hams have about the rules and what is expected of them, he said. The ARRL is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. In the United States and Northern California, nearly one month after its flames began, the Dixie Fire has become the second largest wildfire in that state's history. With the Dixie Fire knocking out communications and wiping one town off the map and forcing thousands in Northern California to evacuate, a group of amateur radio operators helped emergency responders continue to get the word out. Lake Almador Emergency Radio Net was on the air, trading real-time information with one another and neighbors. AMS were monitoring 7.199 MHz and conducting their emergency net on 147.420 simplex. They also jumped in to help the Peninsula Fire Department troubleshoot their problems when the main firehouse radio failed along with repeater issues. Mark Burnham, K6FEJ, was one of the net's members and said that the modified 2-meter radios had to be installed in the fire chief's vehicle for backup and at the firehouse crew's headquarters. Mark said the Yezu radio is modified by Iran NB6X to operate on the fire department frequency, and a 12-volt power supply and a J-pole were added outside the building. The hams also set up a scanner on the main fire frequency near the firefighters' sleeping quarters, so they'd be able to hear calls. Another member of the net, Dale, KM6BQY, remained in the mandatory evacuation zone because he's also involved in search and rescue work. By the middle of the second week of August, the Dixie Fire was declared the largest wildfire burning in the U.S. It had already destroyed nearly 500,000 acres and is only 21% contained as we go to air tonight. Now, if you've spent any time just spinning idly across the amateur bands, you cannot fail to have noticed some signals which are very strong, very wide, and seem to crop up almost anywhere. And once established, they stay for days, sometimes weeks. Amateur transmissions tend to be relatively short and of course don't tend to stay on one frequency for days on end. So these are probably intruders in our ham bands who may or may not have the right to be there. Fortunately, the International Amateur Radio Union has a specialist department which looks out for these stations and tries to keep our precious ham bands clear. Their latest newsletter has just been published. The latest report from the IARU Region 1 monitoring system suggests that the Pluto 2 over-the-horizon radar system at the UK sovereign base area of Akrotiri in Cyprus may have been causing interference in several amateur radio bands.
Besides the well-known daily encountered intruders, there were also some newer and rather rarely heard signals that were noticeable. For example, the CHN30 burst signal from China, which was repeatedly encountered on different frequencies in the 40-metre amateur band. Western NATO military systems were also more active in our bands. Signals such as MIL-188, LINK-11 Clue, STANAG 4285 and STANAG 4481, as well as various AIL transmissions. AIL stands for Automatic Link Establishment. From further afield, FSK-ARQ and PSK-ARU emissions, with typical 600 bode, 600 Hz or 1200 Hz parameters, have been conspicuous from time to time. They're known as DPRK-600 and 1200 respectively, and are attributed to North Korea. For many days in the last month, a Link 11 clue station was active on 7159 kHz in double sideband mode, about 6 kHz wide, and at times causing heavy interference. This station has regularly attracted the attention and the wrath of radio hands in the 40-metre band. Predominantly, the -the over-the-horizon radar systems, for example the Russian container, as well as the British Pluto system from Cyprus, were annoying. On 14301.9 kHz, an orthogonal frequency division multiplexing data transmission called OFDM60 could be found from time to time. And some broadcast radio stations interfere regularly in the amateur bands. First of all, Radio France International is on 7205 kHz, just above the 40-metre amateur band, but it splatters down to 7186 kHz late in the evening from 21 to 22 hours UTC. The Voice of the Broad Masses, which is the official radio station of Eritrea, based in Asmara, is regularly found in the amateur band on 7140 and 7180 kHz. CRI, China Radio International, is often found on 14 kHz exactly, due to intermodulation from 13855 and 13710 kHz. On 18080 kHz, the sound of hope from Taiwan, which is also often being jammed, is sometimes audible, if conditions permit. The International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System, Region 1 July 2021 newsletter, can be found at www.iaru-r1.org. And recordings of military transmissions can be found on the Signal Identification Guide Wiki at www.sigidwiki.com. That's www.sigidwiki.com. Hams from the Algerian National Society, ARA, had begun assisting with emergency communications as deadly forest fires swept through the northern region. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 reported that at least 65 lives were claimed by the blaze raging in the town of Wasif in the province of Tizi Uzu, operating on 7.110, 3.650, and 14.300 MHz, hams were establishing communications between the mobile station in Wasif and the crisis center in Tamda. We will have more details on this story as they become available. Dwayne, W4FDT, and Doug, N4DJR, will be flying to Alaska on August 11th to meet up with Jeremy, KL7EC, and Eric, KL5BO, for an 800-mile interior Alaska Parks on the Air activation. They have a list of around 25 parks they're going to attempt to activate. However, the team suspects that they won't be able to activate all parks on the air, but they will be able to activate a good majority of them, and will be focusing on those that haven't been activated before. Their call signs that will be used are KL7EC, KL5BO, W4FDT stroke KL7, and N4DJR stroke KL7. Operators will be spotting themselves on the Parks on the Air spotting page at HTTP colon forward slash forward slash P-O-T-A dot A-P-P and will be using the JS-8 call and Winlink email to get their spots out to the page. Operations will take place between August 13th through the 15th. If you are a park hunter, this will be your time to get some parks in the log that may not ever be activated again or if you just need Alaska for your worked all states, then they're going to be available for you also. Many hams enjoy getting out of the house to operate. Engaging in such activities as summits on the air, parks on the air, or islands on the air. Now it's time to try mines on the air. 
but banish any thoughts of underground operating. The spark plug for this activity is Johnny F. Fuller, WJ0NF, in Colorado. I decided to start the Mines on the Air project because mines are everywhere in my area, and I was already checking them out and researching their history, Fuller explained, on the Mines on the Air website. He got into ham radio after losing internet, cell, and landline service for the fourth time in 2016. Minds on the Air aims to see operators get out of the shack, enjoy the hobby, and take others along for the ride. It is meant to promote the hobby, enjoy the world around us, and bring a bit of history into our lives, Fuller said. I encourage activators to document their adventures with photos and videos that they can share with everyone, either via this site, their own sites, or YouTube videos. He continued, I would also encourage activators to bring back part of the enjoyment via QSL cards. If you have the means, spend a few dollars and create a one-of-a-kind limited edition QSL cards for the spotters that couldn't be there. Fuller said he's planned on limited runs of 20 or 30 cards for each activation, each card bearing an image of the relevant mine. We are just starting out, and I am sure things will change as the project grows, Fuller said. For now, I would like to create a form where Minds on the Air activators can fill out the relevant information and submit it for addition to the database. Once the project grows past a critical point, we will have to move to a more interactive site where you can search through the database and upload information on your own. Fuller said to activate a mine and have it added to the database, just include information describing where the site is located and photographic proof that the operator was there. If a link to a website for the mine is available, he'd like that included too. Fuller's activation requirements page has more details. Fuller has one more important caveat. Activating a mine for mines on the air is not meant for people to risk their health or lives by exploring unsafe locations. No more than summits on the air or islands on the air. In each activity, you need to use common sense. Stay out of these old mines and be safe. He notes that not all mine sites are open to the public. Make sure you know ahead of time what legal access you have to the location, he said. Robert Ringwald, K6YBV, was a lifelong amateur radio operator who also made his mark on the jazz world as a jazz ambassador and co-organizer in 1974 of California's first Sacramento Jazz Festival, where his band was a headliner. A professional jazz pianist, he was also an enthusiastic radio amateur. First licensed in 1957, he soon became adept in CW, which he identifies on his QRZ page as his most frequent mode. Bob became a silent key on August 3rd. Blind almost since birth, Bob became known to many checking into the Alaska Pacific Preparedness Net on 20-meter single sideband, the California Traffic Net on 75-meter single sideband, the Northern California Net, the Region Net 6, and the Pacific Area Net on 80 and 40-meter CW. He was especially proud of his daughter, actress Molly Ringwald, and took great pains to keep things authentic when she portrayed an amateur radio operator in one episode of the NBC sitcom The Facts of Life. Bob wrote, Naturally, the writers had Molly's lines all wrong. I volunteered to write the ham talk to be authentic, and they gratefully accepted. Molly also used her father's call sign in the episode. His daughter has also appeared in The Breakfast Club, Sixteen Candles, and Pretty in Pink. Robert Ringwald, K6YBV, became a silent key at the age of 80. Faith Hannah Lee, KD3Z, is the first place winner of the Intrepid DX Group first annual Youth Dream Rig Essay Contest. She'll take home an ICOM IC7300 transceiver, a vertical flagpole antenna from Grayline Performance Antennas, a Heil Sound headset, a PowerWorks power supply, and a Morse QRP Nano Morse code key. Second place winner is Charlie Meadows, and for VTI, he's a recipient of a Yesu FT65R radio and a $50 DX Engineering gift card. Patrick Gothrop, W9GGG, was the third place winner. He received a Baofeng BFFHHP radio and a $50 DX Engineering gift card. We received over 60 essays from all over the world. Intrepid DX President Paul Ewing 
N6 PSE said, The essays were unique in thought and very well articulated. Extra points were given for proper grammar, punctuation, and spelling. Most of the essays gave a unique perspective on how to reach out and connect with the youth of today. We can tell you that our search and our youth was full of great ideas. Most of the essays gave unique perspectives on how to reach out and connect with the youth of today. We can tell you that our youth was full of great ideas and brimming with enthusiasm to keep our hobby alive well into the future. The Intrepid DX Group plans to publish several of the essays on its Facebook page. The Radio Society of Great Britain has announced further details of its online convention, which will be held on Saturday the 9th of October. The event will be streamed live on the RSGB YouTube channel, and there will be a great lineup of expert speakers to inspire you. The keynote speaker's presentation will be announced shortly. Whether you're new to amateur radio or have been enjoying it for years, do put the date in your diary. The RSGB will be releasing more details over the coming weeks. You can find out more from the convention web pages www.rsgb.org forward slash convention. There will be two lecture streams, an introduction to and learn more about. You can stick with one stream or dip in and out of both. The choice is yours. Some of the topics promised are soldering, skills, ideas and tips, SOTA, POTA and IOTA, QRP the expedition fun, club log for absolute beginners, having fun with electronics, coding and amateur radio, software defined radio, the VP8 PJ 2020 D expedition to the South Orkney Islands, and precision microwave engineering, the fun of making your own components. There will be an interactive question and answer session after each presentation, and there'll be a live feed and content from the RSGB National Radio Centre. Coming up, how podcasts work and how best to subscribe to them. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, Welcome. Good to see you. I stumbled upon podcastindex.org earlier today, and it piqued my interest. I was under the impression I could access all podcast shows and apps, but apparently not. From what I understand, there are multiple podcast indexes out there, which all have different content. Yes and no. So podcastindex.org is a venture from Adam Curry, the podfather, one of the early, uh, in fact, perhaps the earliest podcaster. Adam uh, was instrumental in getting RSS feeds to be amended by Dave Weiner, the creator of RSS, to include audio files or any binary blob, but audio files or video files is what makes it a podcast. So podcasts, the definition of podcast is... Uh, like this, an audio show you can download, you can listen to or watch. doesn't have to be audio, I should say. Any show, <laughs> audio or video, here you are watching me, if you're watching the video, uh, that you can download. But the key is that there is a directory, an RSS, or really simple syndication feed, that is updated whenever there's a new show. Why is that good? Well, there used to be a lot of RSS readers out there. Google Reader, the best known, but there were a great many of them. There, We've gone through the great RSS winter, but in the in 15 years ago, 16 years ago when podcast first started, people would follow uh, the RSS feeds of their favorite blogs in an RSS reader. Instead of going to the website of the blog, they'd go to the reader and they'd say, it's, when there's a new blog post, they'd see it there and they would read it. So what Adam convinced Dave Weiner to do is add audio or video files to that so they could also go to their RSS reader and they'd see, oh, there's a new version of the tech guy available, new edition of it, and they could press the play button and listen. It wasn't very long before dedicated podcast applications were written, and they worked the same way as, a, as any RSS reader. Uh, you would subscribe to the podcast, usually by typing in a URL, and then from then on, whenever the podcast was updated, the podcast client would download the podcast so you could listen to it. In the early days, it was most commonly iTunes. So people would set up iTunes with a subscription. The podcast would be downloaded. And then whenever they synced up their podcast, their iPod, remember that? You had to plug it in to your computer and you'd sync it up and it would copy the podcast over to their iPod and they could then listen. We've come a long way. Nowadays, almost all podcast consumption comes over phones. But still, people often use 
podcast clients, and there are a lot of them. The number one is still iTunes, but Pocket Cast is also very popular. Perhaps you use Overcast or Stitcher or Slacker. Maybe use the Apple Podcast app or the Google Podcast app. These are all applications that are really just RSS readers that subscribe to the RSS feed of the podcast, and whenever there's a new show, download it so you can listen to it. Subscribing to a podcast really just means download it whenever there's a new one. Keep an eye on it whenever there's a new one, download it. All right. So why do we need podcast directories? Well, every podcast app has a directory. If you go to Pocket Casts or Google Podcasts, you'll see suggested podcasts. You'll see a list of podcasts. You'll see a search. All of that is a directory that is provided by the podcast client. In the case of Google, it's all the podcasts available in the Google Play. Uh, in the case of Apple, it's iTunes. It's all the podcasts available on iTunes. And the reason Adam started Podcast Index is because some podcasts have been blocked. Alex Jones, for instance, is blocked on iTunes. You can't find his podcast searching the iTunes directory. I suspect it's the same with Google Podcasts and probably most other podcast clients. So Adam says he wants to create a uh, a podcast index free of corporate entities, influence, and finance. Don't censor me. Well, it is true that directories are an important way that podcasts get discovered. For instance, if somebody told you, oh, Leo Laporte has a podcast called Ask the Tech Guy, you might open your podcast client and search for Ask the Tech Guy. And if it's not in that directory, you wouldn't find it. But this is an important point. <laughs> you wouldn't find it in Podcast Index either because... It's not using Podcast Index. I think Adam's idea is maybe he's going to create an index that future podcast clients will use. But most podcast clients, certainly Google and Apple, the two big ones, are they? there's some editorial control. That's They do control it. They are gatekeepers. And they're not going to use Adam Curry's directory. They're just going to keep using their own directory. The good news is the iTunes directory is easy to get into if you create a podcast. One of the very first things you're going to do is go to the iTunes podcast section and add your podcast. And what you're adding, by the way, is the address of the feed. The feeds usually end with XML. That's the format that RSS understands. But there are some other extensions. But that's that's the key. Now, I have to tell you, that's not the only way to find a podcast. And so what I'm going to show you today is if you know you want a podcast, yeah, you could look in the podcast directory. But you should never be stopped just because you didn't find it. For instance, uh, you won't find Alex Jones' podcast in there for a variety of reasons. But you can always Google it. And that Google directory is a little different. It's a lot harder to get kicked out of Google. Usually it's not because of politics or fake news or misinformation. If you're kicked out of Google, it's probably because you tried to game Google's search index. That's not so nice. But in most cases, most podcasts are not doing that. So if you Google search, for instance, the Alex Jones podcast, you're going to find a number of entries. In fact, probably the next best thing was to add RSS to that. And that'll take you directly to, you see that, the RSS feed. Now, if you see that button that says RSS and click it, this is an RSS feed. You're not going to really want to use that. That's not designed to be human readable. But you see, it really is a listing of all the shows. What you really want is this. This is the address. That's what we're going to type in. Now, to add that or any podcast that you found that way, once you find the XML file, the RSS feed, now it's an easy thing to do to launch the Apple Podcasts app. And this will work on any device. They kind of hide where you would add this, but I'm going to show you how to do it on Apple's. And you'll see it's, it's very similar on most podcast apps. This is the directory, right? This is Apple's directory. And by the way, I should show you, if I search Apple's directory for Alex Jones... And you can read up on why you won't find Alex. Oh, you'll find Joe Rogan. You'll find Surreal Talk. You'll find Louder with Crowder. You'll find other podcasts, but you won't find Alex Jones' actual. Oh, well, maybe you will. I take it back. So it is in the directory. Is this an actual Alex Jones podcast? I thought he was. Yeah, that's somebody else's who's trying to ride on his name. 
So, which is not unusual. That's another reason why these directories are not ideal. Anybody can get in these directories. So, no Alex Jones podcast, but that's no problem because we already know what the feed is. If we go to the file menu for the podcast app, you'll see add a show by URL. Now, this will have some discovery features. So even if you don't have the actual XML feed, you can often just paste in a web page and it'll find it. But watch, I'm going to paste in the Alex Jones feed, press the subscribe button. Ah, and now I have it. That He is in my library now. So that's all you really need to do is paste that URL in. And again, that URL is not necessarily in every directory. But it's almost always going to be in Google. So the trick if you want to find a podcast and you don't see it in your directory is to Google the podcast name and maybe RSS feed and find the actual link. We at Twit, we actually have a page dedicated to RSS feeds. It's our subscribe page. So if you go to twit.tv slash subscribe, some links. So, for instance, here's Ask the Tech Guy. And you'll see links to audio and video. Now, we do link directly into Apple Podcasts. That is not an RSS feed. That's a link into their directory or Google Podcasts or YouTube. But you'll notice you'll also see this button that says subscribe via RSS. You're looking for that. And there it is, that familiar gobbledygook that's RSS. But there's the feed address. And that's what you want, which is feeds.twit.tv slash atg.xml. You could enter that address into any podcast client. I'll show you what it looks like on the uh, iPhone because it's a little bit different on the iPhone. You're looking for a way to enter in a URL directly. So because I've added this, by the way, on my Macintosh, you see the same podcast is there. I'm going to delete that because I don't, I don't really want to get that podcast added. So I'm going to delete that from my library. But how would I add an arbitrary podcast? If I, if I do a search and I don't see it, well, I can uh, always go to my library. So click the library tab, hit edit, and that's where you're going to find the magic. Add a show by URL. And you can type in or paste in uh, the URL for the RSS feed and subscribe to it, and you'll get it. So you can do this manually quite easily. Well, but maybe not as easily as in a directory. So why do we even have podcast directories? Well, Certainly, every app should have a directory. And in the perfect world, every app would have a directory that includes all podcasts. But frankly, there are so many podcasts, hundreds of thousands at this point. You can't expect a Pocket Cast or Overcast to have a complete directory. It'll have a directory of popular shows, shows that people who use the app use uh, or listen to on a regular basis. It'll probably be in there. Usually, that directory is sorted by the most popular based on that particular applications, listenership, that kind of thing. But in no podcast app that I know of, can you not always manually enter a show? So find the show's feed, its RSS feed, paste it in, and now you're subscribed. The good news is you won't have to ever do that again. And if you use a podcast app like Apple's or Pocket Casts or Google's that automatically syncs it to your account and makes it this, you know, subscribe once, subscribe everywhere, you won't have to ever worry about it again. It'll be on your phone, it'll be on your computer, it'll be on all your devices. I think Adam probably is, I don't know why Adam's creating this. I think his heart's in the right place. He says, you know, why shouldn't there be an index of every podcast? But understand, in order for that to work, every podcaster in the world has to add their podcast to that Adam Curry's podcast, index.org. And by the way, that's not the only one. There are dozens of these. We get solicitations all the time from people who say, add us to our, add, add you, add yourself to our podcast index, add yourself to our, po and frankly, I don't see the advantage. I want to be on iTunes. I want to be on Overcast. I want to be on Pocket Cast. We are, but I don't really care that much if I'm on a bunch of random podcast directories that nobody ever searches or looks at. If you're on Google, oh, by the way, you should have a website. And if you're creating a podcast, make sure somewhere clearly on that website is your RSS feed, maybe a button or a link that says, here's our RSS feed, so that somebody looking for you can find your website and find that feed and add it to their client. So to answer your question, I'm not sure why Adam has created this. I think it's probably not necessary. Adam has done something similar in the past. You may remember Pod Show, which became Mevio. 
he calls that a podcast network, but really his goal was to get every podcast in the world on that thing. That failed, and uh, maybe he's trying to do it again? I don't know. We'll add ourselves to Podcast Index, sure, but I wouldn't say that it's a necessity for anybody. It's it's not necessary. Does that make sense? And there's a good way to, to subscribe to podcasts so that, you know, it is a free speech thing. As long as a podcast has an RSS feed, anybody can subscribe, anybody can listen, and no one can stop you. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Okay, I knew it would happen. When I started this series, I expected three questions would be asked. When did ham radio start? Who was the first ham? And where did the word ham come from? To answer these questions, let's head back to the 19th century. Practical Wireless had its start in 1896, when Marconi first sent a signal over a distance of two miles. By 1899, he succeeded in sending a wireless message across the English Channel a distance of 32 miles. The year 1899 also marks the first construction project which appeared in American Electrician magazine. In December 1901, Marconi claimed to bridge the Atlantic, a feat which caught the world's attention and fueled the imagination of thousands of potential amateurs who took their first steps into wireless. In the early days, everything was spark. What exactly was spark? Well, Sit down some summer night, listen to your AM or shortwave radio, and count the static crashes. Now, turn on the vacuum cleaner or an electric shaver and listen to your radio again. Hear that noise? In short, spark wireless was merely a form of controlled static. A high voltage inside a spark coil would jump across a gap, which was coupled to an antenna. The spark was keyed on and off to transmit the code. The signal generated was extremely broad. A state-of-the-art 1906 spark transmitter operating on 400 meters or 750 kilocycles would actually generate a signal from about 250 meters or 1200 kilocycles to 550 meters or 545 kilocycles. Receivers were no better. Before 1912, all systems were basically unamplified detectors. Tuners were primitive or non-existent. As might be expected, by today's standards, the early wireless stations were terribly inefficient. Transmitting ranges ranged from as little as 600 feet with a one-half inch coil to perhaps 100 miles from a kilowatt station and a 15-inch spark coil. Ships at sea with five kilowatt transmitters might get as much as 500 miles maximum range over the ocean. It was into this world that the early amateurs ventured. Actually, if we were to concentrate on the years prior to 1908, it would be more appropriate to say experimenters rather than amateurs. For, in the first decade of wireless, there was little or no interest in personal communications with other stations. Rather, the concentration was on technical development, either in the interest of pure science or, more often than not, with an eye towards cashing in on this new medium. Experimenters were unorganized and, with the exception of those immediate stations with whom they ran tests, had no knowledge or interest in other pioneer stations. Any true amateurs prior to 1908 had been lost in prehistoric obscurity. By 1908, however, the face of wireless began to change. Technical developments had reached their first plateau and a number of major competitors had formed the first wireless trust, called United Wireless. With a temporary truce in effect, equipment was now more readily available to the public. Along with this, new magazines such as Modern Electrics were formed with wireless communication as the primary thrust. The circulation of Modern Electrics jumped from 2,000 to over 30,000 in just two years. The year 1908 also saw the first handbook, Wireless Telegraph Construction for Amateurs. It is difficult to know exactly how many amateur stations were on the air in this completely unregulated laissez-faire era, but reliable estimates put the number of major stations, 
that is, those capable of communicating over 10 miles at 600, while minor stations with a one or two mile range probably numbered 3,000 or more. Thus, if a year had to be arbitrarily chosen as the start of amateur radio, it would probably be 1908. As for the first amateur, that's a harder one. Without licensing regulations or written record, there will never be a definitive answer to this question. However, the name W.E.D. Stokes Jr. has come up. He was a founding member and the first president of the first amateur radio club, the Junior Wireless Club Limited of New York City. This organization was formed on January 2, 1909. Other founding members who might lay claim to the title first amateur were George Eltz, Frank King, and Fred Seymour. Later that same year, the Wireless Association of America and the Radio Club of Salt Lake City were created. By 1910, wireless clubs were springing up all over the country and the first call book, the Wireless Blue Book, was published. Since there were no regulations in this period, the call signs listed in the Blue Book were self-assigned, which brings us to our third question, where did the word ham come from? The most logical explanation is that commercial operators referred to the unlicensed and sometimes inexperienced amateurs as hams, probably meaning ham-handed or ham-fist. Amateurs, however, took this derogatory term and turned it into a lasting and complimentary nickname. However, legend has it there was a phenomenal station on the air with five kilowatts, who could be heard at all hours of the day and night at distances of over 500 miles. The station operator used his initials for his call sign, H-A-M. I don't know if this is the real story, but I've always liked this explanation best. Amateur radio continued to grow. By 1911, Modern Electrics had a circulation of 52,000, and there were 10,000 amateurs in the country. With thousands of stations on the air, both amateur and commercial, Interference was becoming a serious problem, especially in maritime communication. Ships, because of their restricted antenna length, were limited to frequencies between 450 and 600 meters, or 666 to 500 kilocycles. As we have seen, one spark station could take up this entire spectrum. Thus, it was imperative that all stations cooperate and stand by when the others were transmitting. Sadly, this was often not the case. In addition to interference between amateurs and commercial stations, there was more interference and sometimes deliberate jamming between commercial stations of different companies. Prodded by the Navy, which was using inefficient and outdated equipment and thus suffering from excessive interference, the U.S. Congress was starting to take a serious look at wireless regulation. However, before they could take up proposed legislation, an incident happened that would quickly and dramatically alter the structure of the wireless spectrum. On April 15, 1912, the RMS Titanic struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank. Thanks to wireless and the first SOS in history, 713 lives were saved. However, it has been argued that the number of survivors could have been doubled or even tripled if there were stronger wireless regulations in effect. We are going to keep a sharp eye on the Titanic and on a 22-year-old experimenter in Yonkers, New York, who would soon be making some major contributions to radio. So, until then, keep that spark gap adjusted and those raspy CQs coming. We'll catch you next time on the Ancient Amateur Archives. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. SpaceX, Elon Musk's giant California-based space technology company, has acquired a satellite communications company co-founded by an amateur radio operator. The merger makes Swarm Technologies a wholly owned subsidiary of SpaceX. Swarm, which specializes in Internet of Things technology and low-cost satellite connectivity, has asked the FCC to transfer control of its Earth and Space Station licenses. Swarm was founded in 2016 by Ben Longmire, KF5KMP, and Sarah Spangolo. In 2020, the company launched its first dozen commercial satellites, established ground stations in Alaska, New Jersey, Washington State, Guam, the Azores, and elsewhere, and began expanding market access. Swarm is licensed in non-voice, non-geostationary mobile satellite service, operating in the bands between 137 and 138 megahertz, 
and 148 to 139 decimal 95 megahertz. In 2020, Swarm Technologies placed second in the most innovative space companies list created by the Fast Company. The top spot went to SpaceX. It's time for this week's propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that activity continues to be very weak. With the latest 45-day outlook, it seems to indicate more of the same looking ahead. Sunspots only appeared on three out of the seven days in August. That would be the 5th through the 11th reporting week, and these days were not consecutive. Average daily sunspot numbers actually rose a little from 6 to 9.9, Average daily solar flux softened from 74.8 to 73.7, while the average daily planetary A and dice went from 8 to 6.3, while middle latitude averages were 7, down from 8.7 last week. The predicted solar flux over the next few weeks shows a predicted maximum of only 75 on just one day. That would be September 11th. The solar flux forecast from the USAF and the NOAA shows 73 on August 14th, 72 on August 15th through the 19th, 73 on August 20th, 74 on August 21st to September 1st, 73, 72, 72, 74, and 74 on September 2nd through the 6th. The predicted planetary A and dice is 8 on August 14th and 15th, 5 on August 16th through the 22nd, 5 on August 17th through the 22nd, 8, 12, and 8 on August 23rd through the 25th, 5 on August 26th through September 1st, 8 and 12 on September 2nd and 3rd, and 8 on September 4th through the 6th. Now with a quick look at what some scientists are claiming that solar cycle 25 may peak sooner than expected, here is Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo. Astronomers in India have found an explanation for why the rotation profile of the sun changes sharply in some latitudes. It's long been known that the sun's equator spins faster than the poles. An article in the journal Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society shows how the slight difference in temperature between solar poles and equator is balanced by the centrifugal force appearing due to solar differential rotation. A view into the internal rotation of the sun using sound waves reveals the existence of a layer where its rotation profile changes sharply. This is called the near-surface shear layer and exists very close to the solar surface where there is an outward decrease in angular velocity. Understanding this shear layer is crucial for the understanding of solar phenomena like sunspot formation and the solar cycle. And this new insight may very well inform predictions that solar cycle 25 is heating up faster than expected. The latest sign may be found in sunspot counts from July 2021. Continuing a trend that it started last year, they overperformed the official forecast issued by the Joint NOAA and NASA Solar Cycle 25 Prediction Panel in 2019. The official forecast calls for Solar Cycle 25 to peak in July 2025. However, a better fit to current data shows Solar Cycle 25 peaking in October 2024. This is just outside the eight month error bars of the panel's forecast. July 2021 was a remarkable month. Solar Cycle 25 crossed multiple thresholds, including its first X flare, and at one point there were six sunspots on the solar disk. The last time so many sunspots were seen at the same time was during September 2017. One far-side coronal mass ejection in July was so strong it affected Earth, despite being on the wrong side of the Sun. A full circular shockwave was observed, and a handful of other coronal mass ejections narrowly missed our planet. In spite of all the solar activity last month, the start of August turned out to be really rather quiet, but surely it can't be too much longer before we really start to notice changes in propagation. Time now for the AMSAT report. A couple of weeks ago, we gave you a quick primer on listening for the SO50 FM satellite. The next step is making your first contact. SO50 will always have someone on it during North American passes. You'll want to store three frequencies for transmitting. The center frequency will be 145.850. Above and below that, you'll want frequencies at the smallest step your radio can enter. 
Assign a 67 Hz CTCSS tone on all three frequencies. If you're using 1HT or radio, don't worry about trying to correct for Doppler on transmit, just on receive. With two radios, it's much easier, and full duplex lets you hear if you're getting into the satellite. On a single radio, tweaking the transmit frequency the same way you're adjusting the receive frequency will sometimes improve your transmit signal. With a little practice, you'll be good to go. If you have a question about working the satellites, get in touch with Bruce Page, KK5DO, who provides this report each week as a courtesy. His email is kk5do at arrl.net. In mid-July, AMSAT announced that AO109, also known as RAD FX SAT2 or AMSAT Fox 1E, was being opened for amateur use. AMSAT advised operators to use efficient modes for making contact such as CW or FD4 because current issues with the satellite are making SSB voice contacts challenging at best. After soliciting telemetry reports from the satellite, the AMSAT engineering and operations team is continuing its efforts to debug AO109. First, the telemetry we have received confirms what we've inferred from our earlier experiments, AMSAT announced over the weekend. It said antennas are open, AO-109 is in transponder mode, and the spacecraft does receive commands successfully, especially from a strong command station. The team has also determined that the onboard telemetry is working, but the transmitter output is very low, between 6 and 8 milliwatt. You can compare this to our pre-launch testing, which showed power output of somewhat over 100 milliwatts as designed, AMSAT said. It's hypothesizing that one of the dual-power amplifier chips has failed. Efforts to command higher output from the telemetry modulator into the mixer and power amplifier resulted in no change. It may imply that 8 milliwatts is the highest to expect from the transponder as well, AMSAT said. AMSAT said some data for the Vanderbilt University commercial off-the-shelf radiation experiment have been retrieved. Vanderbilt funded AO109 conceding that its Earth stations will require more robust receiving capabilities, it continues to solicit telemetry from AO109. Both for Vanderbilt University and for our own engineering testing, we would really appreciate even a few frames of telemetry that any stations can receive, AMSAT said. AMSAT provides a web page at amsat.org that reports on the health of AO109. HAMS in Hyderabad have found a homebrew solution to make communication via the QO100 satellite easier for other amateurs. They have designed prototype converters that will enable the HAMS to use the transponders on board the geosynchronous satellite. The prototypes include both up converters and down converters. Homebrewers Sassy Bushhan, VU2XZ, and A. Armandra, VU2AAP, told the Talangana Today newspaper that the converters eliminate the need for such expensive equipment as software-defined radios. They said the system works in a way similar to a TV set-top box that receives programs beamed from satellites, converting radio waves into signals for the TV. The circuit boards within the converter are designed to communicate via the 10 GHz frequency for downlink and the 2.4 GHz frequency for uplink. Sassy said the first hams to be given the opportunity to use the converters are members of the Lamican Amateur Radio Club in Hyderabad. A transverter is also in the works, combining uplink and downlink capability. As summer comes to a close, members of the W9IMS Special Events Station are busy wrapping up another week of worldwide contacts during the annual Brickyard Race. As the official amateur radio club for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the W9IMS group has been logging hundreds of contacts during the Indy Grand Prix, the Indianapolis 500 Mile Race, and now the Brickyard Race. The official numbers will be tabulated in the coming days, and then each contact will receive a special QSL card designed for each event. Those stations that made the log for all three races will receive a commemorative certificate as well. This is the 18th year for the W9 IMS Special Events Station, and despite weak band conditions this spring, early reports indicated that they logged over 6,000 contacts during the first two races. The W9 IMS team is hoping to double that amount in the final race of the season. Foundations of Amateur Radio 
Recently, I illustrated the diversity of our community by highlighting social media posts made to a single community over a 24-hour period, each reflecting a different aspect of our community. It occurred to me that although those things are amateur radio, some more obviously than others, there's a whole other side of the community that isn't amateur radio. Look at radio astronomy, for example. One of my friends is an astronomer, and we've been having loads of fun learning from each other. I'm getting exposed to concepts like Fourier transforms, interferometry, sampling, and plenty of the mathematical concepts that underlie my interest in amateur radio. Then there's things like physics. While I've always been interested, long before I met my physics teacher in high school who helped me kick off a career in computing, I've been playing with light bulbs, batteries, disassembling old hardware like the valve radio that I was given when I was about 12 or so. There's the continued curiosity about audio. I've been making mixtapes since I was nine, and that has blossomed into an ongoing interest in audio production, some of which is reflected in my weekly podcast and fueled by my hearing loss. My interests outside amateur radio have always been wide and varied. I've learned to fly an aeroplane, learned to navigate a sailboat, learned to drive a truck, installed satellite dishes in the bush and built a mobile satellite ground station, built software solutions for piggeries and bakeries, provided logistics for remote outback events, built vehicle-mounted GPS tracking and mapping solutions, and I continue to read articles as they come my way. What amateur radio has given me is a context, a framework, if you like, to bring together these wide-ranging fields and make them hang together. An obvious, though simple, example is learning the phonetic alphabet. In amateur radio, it's a given that you'll need to learn that so that you can effectively communicate using a poor signal path. But my phonetic learning predates my amateur radio exposure by at least a dozen years. In order to pass my aviation radio certificate, I was required to learn the phonetic alphabet before I was allowed to use the radio. It's only a small example, but it's illustrative on how, for me at least, amateur radio is the glue that binds it all together. It happens at other levels too. I've mentioned in the past that looking at a television antenna on the roof of any house before getting a license was a non-event. Today, I can't look without thinking about propagation, how the antenna is aligned, and if it's installed back to front or not. Once you know a thing, it's hard to unsee or unlearn the background of it. The same happens when I spot an antenna in the wild, stuck to a lamppost or bolted to a random roadside cabinet. Previously, they would go unremarked. Today, I wonder what information they're transmitting or receiving, what band they're operating on, who owns the equipment, and what interference they might be causing or experiencing in their environment. I have a growing interest in computer-controlled manufacturing, like 3D printing, laser engraving, and CNC, and spend some of the available time in the day learning about how that works, how to improve things, and I wonder about how the speed of communications between the various components create an RF field of some sort, and what that does to other components and circuits. As a final experience, recently I had a medical procedure where there was a notice supplied with the logging hardware that specifically called out amateur radio as a source of electromagnetic radiation and that I was required to refrain during the process due to a potential failure of the equipment. If anything, for the first time in a long time, I felt that there was a visible link between my hobby and the rest of the community, since that notice was given to every single person, not just the radio amateurs. Some links between amateur radio and the rest of the world are visible, and some are not. What kinds of interactions between the hobby and society at large have you come across? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. There's encouraging news for broadband subscribers in rural areas of the United Kingdom. Communications companies have been given the official go-ahead to use water pipes instead of having to dig new trenches to connect homes and businesses to the Internet using fiber optic cable services. Here with more details on this project is Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, reporting from the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service. In the UK, fibre broadband cables could be fed through the country's water pipes as part of the government's plan to speed up the nationwide rollout of lightning-fast broadband and mobile coverage in rural areas. 
Four million pounds is available for cutting-edge innovators to trial what could be a quicker and more cost-effective way of connecting fibre optic cables to homes, businesses and mobile masts, without the disruption caused by digging up roads and land. Civil works, in particular installing new ducts and poles, can make up as much as four-fifths of the cost to industry of building new gigabit-capable broadband networks. This new scheme could turbocharge the government's £5 billion plan, called Project Gigabit, to level up broadband access in hard-to-reach areas, as well as the £1 billion shared rural network, which will bring strong and reliable 4G phone signals to many of the most isolated parts of the country. The UK government's Digital Infrastructure Minister, Matt Warman, said that the cost of digging up roads and land is the biggest obstacle telecoms companies face when connecting hard-to-reach areas to better broadband. But beneath our feet, there's a vast network of pipes reaching virtually every building in the country. So, the government are calling on Britain's brilliant innovators to help use this infrastructure to serve a dual purpose of serving up not just fresh and clean water, but also lightning-fast digital connectivity. The project will also look to test solutions that reduce the amount of water lost every day due to leaks, which is 20%, that's one-fifth of the total put into the public supply. It will involve putting connected sensors into the pipes, which will allow water companies to improve the speed and accuracy with which they can identify a leak and repair it. Water companies have committed to delivering a 50% reduction in leakage, and the government says this project can help to reach that goal. Deployment challenges for essential utilities, such as water and telecoms, are complex and tightly regulated because both are part of the UK's critical national infrastructure. The project will consider these regulatory barriers as well as the economic, technical, cultural and collaborative challenges and the impact on consumer bills. Any solution used to trial fibre optic cables in the water mains will be approved by the Drinking Water Inspectorate, the DWI, before being used in a real-world setting. The DWI requires rigorous testing ahead of approving any products that can be used in drinking water pipes. A fibre has already been deployed in water pipes in other countries, such as Spain. The government is already considering giving broadband firms access to more than a million kilometres of underground utility ducts to boost the rollout of next-generation broadband, including electricity, gas and sewer networks, and will soon respond to a consultation on changing regulations to make infrastructure sharing easier. The government has already given broadband suppliers access to existing infrastructure to help speed up the rollout, with electricity poles used extensively throughout England to carry broadband cables. You can read more at www.gov.uk and navigate to the news area. According to the government website, gov.uk, the rollout is expected to take place throughout the country, ending in March 2024, with an emphasis on rural areas. Stephen Unger, commissioner at the Geospatial Commission, issued a statement saying, Our ambition must be for reliable broadband to become as easy to access tomorrow as drinking water is today. The announcement is good news to those concerned about the traditional installation where roads and land are dug up. It is also good news for amateur radio operators who may have reported RFI from broadband's copper wires carrying VDSL broadband services. Here's the current listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. These webinars are a member's only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars and view previously recorded sessions, log on to the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. Introduction to DMR and Digital Voice, hosted by Tim Deegan, KJ8U, will be presented on Thursday, September 9th, 2021, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 1930 UTC. An introductory overview of digital voice technologies for ham radio. This presentation will focus on DMR with notes on System Fusion, D-Star, and more. Included will be a description of digital voice architecture and components and the interesting opportunities and challenges that digital voice presents. 
ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. TV and radio services for more than a million people in the UK will remain off the air indefinitely after a transmitter fire. The blaze at the 315-metre-tall Billsdale Mast last Tuesday disrupted Freeview, DAB and FM radio signals across North Yorkshire, Teesside and parts of County Durham. Operator Arkiva said that it would bring in temporary equipment but could not say when services would be restored. Ron Needham had been hiking on the North York Moors with his wife Sue and reported seeing a huge black cloud of smoke coming from the buildings at the bottom of the mast. Initially, they noticed nothing untoward when they stopped near the mast for lunch, but after walking on for about a mile and a half, they noticed smoke coming from the top of the mast like a chimney, Mr Needham said. Despite the loss of transmission from the tower, BBC television remains available on iPlayer and radio stations can still be listened to on BBC Sounds. The BBC News website reported that firefighters were sent to the location at 1319 BST on Tuesday after a call from an engineer working on the transmitter, which is located near Helmsley in the North Yorkshire Moors. North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service said that there were concerns about the structural integrity of the mast and a 300-metre exclusion zone was in place around it. It also said the cause of the blaze was being investigated but did not believe it was a result of a criminal act. Owner of the mast, Arkiva, confirmed no one was injured in the fire and thanked emergency services for their swift action. A spokesperson said that they had started the process of gradually restoring services using a combination of temporary structures and existing infrastructure elsewhere in the region and will be moving through the process as quickly and as safely as possible. A spokeswoman for North Yorkshire Police said Airwave, the radio service used by all the emergency services, had not been affected by the mast fire. The 315-metre-tall tower was built in 1969 and provides coverage for 500,000 homes across northern England, from Tadcaster to Seaham. Arkiva said about 200,000 of those use Freeview as their main television platform. People have contacted the BBC about how the loss of transmission has affected them, with one viewer saying they were stuck at home with severe disabilities. They said, I really relied on this. There's only so many books I can read in a day, and I can't hold them for long. Another viewer in North Yorkshire told how their 86-year-old neighbour lived alone and had no broadband. They said that they'd fitted a Wi-Fi extender to their internet and given her their Amazon Fire Stick, so she was able to watch television. She's OK now, but many elderly people don't have people to help, they said. The services affected include TV channels on the PSB 1, 2, 3, COM 4, 5, 6, 7 and LTV television multiplexes, BBC Radio Tees, BBC Radios 1 to 4 and BBC DAB. Commercial radio stations affected were SDL, North Yorkshire DAB, Bower Teesside, Digital One, TFM, Capital, Heart and Classic FM. Sky, Freesat and cable services are not affected. Coverage of BBC Radio Tees on DAB is reduced, but some reception should continue for most listeners and there's no need to retune. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Here's a subject most hams have had to deal with, on towers, on the roof, or on the ground. Waterproofing coax connections. Let's look at the four most popular products I know of. The most commonly used product I know of is called coax seal. This stuff is sold on small rolls, about a half an inch wide and 60 inches long. It is easy to apply to clean and dry surfaces. At the size sold, one roll does not cover much except maybe one or two small connectors. My experience with coax seal is it stands up to the elements well over a period of years and is somewhat reusable for the first months in the environment. On a commercial tower, the white strips of paper fly away nicely in a gentle breeze. Being sold on a roll, it is easy to secure several to a climbing belt like rolls of electrical tape. In a tool bag, it tends to get squished into shapes that make it hard to use. 
Another method of protecting connections is with liquid electrical tape. This stuff is commonly sold in small, four ounce cans at the hardware store. These small cans are similar to those used for PVC cement and include a brush. This substance is similar to a solvent dissolved polymer, perhaps even rubber. Since it is kept in a liquid state with solvents, which evaporate when it applied or when the can is left open, you probably don't want to smoke while the can is open. After application with this product, the protective layer tends to be much thinner than with the wrap type sealer. This does make an excellent underlayer when using a wrap on sealer. For ground level connections where repeated layers can be added, this stuff is both easy to use and a good value. Liquid electrical tape probably cannot be applied over coax seal, but it can be applied onto less than perfect surfaces, but again, clean and dry is best. According to the label, multiple layers can be added if you allow the stuff to set for about five minutes. Since it is sold in the can, it rides along in the tool bag, but is easily dropped. Although I've only seen one, this one used a couple of times, some people still use electrical tape to seal coax connections. I do not recommend using electrical tape unless it is used as a cover over one of the wraps or brush on sealers. Problem with electrical tape is it ages poorly when exposed to sunlight, moisture, heat and more. It tends to start to unwrap over time, crack or get brittle. When you've installed as many antennas as I have, you've probably read some mention of how thickly you can cover a connection before you mess up that antenna's ability to shed rainwater. So the bottom line on, on electrical tape is I will not recommend using it as a primary protective layer. The fourth method I know of is similar to coax seal on rolls. Some commercial climbers use insulation wrap for automotive air conditioner systems. There are lots of brands available, so you'll have to go to several auto parts stores to hunt for the really good stuff. This wrap is much wider and thicker than coax seal and comes on a roll just like coax seal. This is made to be wrapped on metal tubes coming in and out of automotive air conditioner compressors to reduce dripping of water, improve efficiency, and protect from the elements. And since it is made to stand up to the elements and is also cost effective, the only startup cost for you is doing the research and finding a brand and a supplier. There are lots of different kinds, so look for the one most like coax seal and test it on your own before using it on someone else's antenna. Oh yeah, there is one more similar to coax seal. It is sold in a toothpaste type tube. I've never used any, so I can't comment on how it holds up to Mother Nature or how it is to use. If anyone out there knows how the sealant in the tube works, or a brand name of the automotive air conditioner wrap that is ideal for tower work, please email me your information. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. A change in rules this year is permitting some new first-timers to get on the air for the 41st annual contest of the Australian Ladies Amateur Radio Association being held this month. The newest entrants are YLs who are in scout and guide groups, and they'll be using their club's equipment and call sign. Linda, VK7QP, writes in the Alara newsletter, The YL Beam, that the event on August 28th and 29th is a friendly contest and a chance to start learning how to operate a contest. YLs of all ages will clearly have the run of the field here. YLs get to work everyone. OMs are only eligible to work YLs. The 24-hour event will offer a combination of SSB and CW contacts. Contacts over Echolink will be accepted, and all other operations will be on the HF bands except for 160 meters and the WARC bands. All licensed operators around the world may enter. ARRL member and professional engineer Les Kramer, WA3SGZ of Longwood, Florida, will be among the 2020 inductees into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame on November 5th. 
The Hall of Fame at the University of South Florida in Tampa recognizes approximately seven Florida inventors every year for significant contributions to technology and society. Kramer holds 17 U.S. patents and two overseas patents spanning lower limb prosthetic devices to advances in electric power generation, IED detection, optical coatings for industrial processes, and dynamic electronic tagging using a sticky polymer. One of my primary inventions is a prosthetic foot that returns energy to both the heel and the toe of the amputee, thereby giving the user a very lifelike feeling and natural control of the foot, said Kramer, who is Vice President of Engineering and Manufacturing at TaylorMade Prosthetics, LLC, in Orlando. The prosthetic foot is used by some 3,000 people worldwide, including two Boston Marathon bombing victims. Kramer said amateur radio has played a key role in his success as an inventor. He has been a ham since 1959 and an ARRL member for more than 50 years. The Miami Herald has published a major article about what happened when Hurricane Maria cut off a town in Puerto Rico and an amateur radio operator found a way to get messages out. As the sun spilled over the storm-stricken mountains of Puerto Rico, all Pedro Labayen, Kilo Papa 4 Delta Kilo Echo could see from his home in Utuado was a river. Hurricane Maria had flooded the town's main avenue, leaving behind potholes, fallen electric poles and floating cars. Flash floods destroyed five bridges across the municipality. Furious winds and rain ripped the roofs off 500 homes. 400 people sheltered in government refuges. Landslides of sandy, volcanic soil destroyed mountain roads. Behind Pedro's home, three elderly bedridden sisters perished under an avalanche of mud. But he didn't yet know the proportions of death and destruction that surrounded him. The monstrous 2017 storm had cut off his town from the rest of the world. Power did not come back onto the town centre until months later, and it took a year for some remote parts of Utuado to get electricity back. Equipped with the ham radio technology he'd loved for decades, KP4DKE set up a communication system over the airwaves that spanned international borders. It enabled residents to tell loved ones they were alive, coordinate aid for people in need, and notify authorities about new developments. He founded the Community Emergency Communications Plan of Utuado. And now, the homegrown network of ham radio operators empowers the Mountain Municipality's residents, offering avenues for crisis communication that are resistant to hurricanes, earthquakes and other natural disasters. In 1970, at the age of 19, Labayen studied for his first ham radio licence, allowing him to send and receive transmissions on regulated airwaves. In the foyer of his home, in the town centre, Pedro set up a hardware and school supply shop. Until the coronavirus pandemic, he sold books and materials to students attending the rural campus of the University of Puerto Rico. Between customers, he tuned into the radio in his store. Of amateur radio, KP4DKE said that, apart from being experimenters, we are ambassadors of peace and good between countries, and we exchange our cultures. Radio amateurs are linked to emergencies. When storms come, phones aren't available. Pedro said, I would participate in these events and I would go to civil defence with my gear. I was the one who supplied the communications at the Utuado level. When Category 3 Hurricane George devastated Puerto Rico in 1998, KP4DKE was able to communicate with foreign embassies. When army members in Fort Buchanan, the only US federal military installation in the region, couldn't reach out to their superiors in the United States, Pedro linked them. Twenty years later, Hurricane Maria arrived. The storm struck Utuado and the rest of Puerto Rico with a fury that no living generation had ever witnessed. Like millions of others, Pedro and his wife were left in shock, attempting to grasp the destruction of the landscape before them. But before Maria arrived, KP4DKE tucked away the antennas that usually stuck out from his house like metallic trees to protect them from the storm. In the aftermath of the hurricane, he set up a simple transmitter on his roof with the help of a neighbour. A solar panel and a car battery energised his equipment and Pedro began to scan for signs of life in the vast airwaves. He called out and a station in the neighbouring Dominican Republic responded, breaking the stillness. Pedro said, I told the Dominicans I need help and they said, no problem. Neighbours and strangers started showing up at Pedro's house, bringing hundreds of written messages to his doorstep for him to send out over the radio. He would send signals out every morning over the Mona Passage that separates Puerto Rico and Hispaniola. 
When radio stations in the Dominican Republic responded, the bridge, as the system came to be known, settled into place. In the afternoons, Pedro would make his way on foot to the broadcast radio station, WUPR, that was miraculously still on the air. Along with the station's anchor, he read the replies townsfolk had been praying to hear. As help began to trickle in and officials restored power and cleared roads, people who'd witnessed Pedro's work during Hurricane Maria approached the radio operator. They wanted to learn how to communicate over the airwaves too. He taught his first class of 15 people at the local emergency management office. Then, when 100 people signed up from the towns as far as the coastal cities of Arecibo and Hatillo, the teacher and the students migrated to a municipal theatre. Now, under his Community Emergency Communications Plan for Utuado, every neighbourhood has at least one licensed radio operator who can go on the airwaves should telecommunications collapse. Local authorities and emergency services, including police, hospitals and firefighters, became part of the network. Families and individuals not licensed to operate as ham radio users were taught to use regular handheld radios to send and receive messages over public frequencies. One new recruit, Zulma Dueño, Kilo Papa 4 Zulu Delta Romeo, joined the Utuado Radio Amateurs Association, the backbone of the community plan that Pedro still leads. From a table in her kitchen, surrounded by the ham radio certificates and awards she's received, Zulma chats away with other local operators. She said, As soon as a storm passes, I can communicate with the police. I can communicate with medical emergencies. I can communicate with another town. She said, The Amateur Radio Association for me is a family, because if anything happens to you, they quickly help. The much more detailed full article, written by Syra Ortiz-Blames, can be found on the Miami Herald website at www.miamiherald.com. Just head for the World Americas area, and there are plenty of photos and a video to see there too. Wolf Harenth, OE1WHC, OE3WHC of Vienna, Austria, died on August 3rd after a brief illness. He was 79. His work as a journalist and broadcaster focused on electronic media and computing. For many years, he worked for Radio Austria International, ROI, where he hosted several programs of interest to shortwave listeners and radio amateurs. These included the German language Kurzwelle Panorama, later Medien Panorama, and finally Intermedia. He was also the founder of the Documentation Archive Funk the Radio Documentary Archive. What began as a QSL card collection is now a considerable archive on the history of radio and the amateur radio service with many contemporary historical documents. The archive now holds some 9 million items, including the legendary Yasmi Colvin collection and more recently the HZ1AB QSL collection, making it the world's largest institution with archival records and collections of any kind on the history of radio with a focus on broadcasting and amateur radio. The holdings are accessible free of charge and are constantly being added to. Less well-known is Herren's work as a literary translator. He was awarded the Austrian State Prize for Literary Translation and the International Astrid Lindgren Translation Prize, among others, for this work. He translated classics such as The Jungle Book and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In 2017, Harenth received the Roy Stevens G2BVN Memorial Award, International Amateur Radio Union Region 1's highest recognition for excellence in amateur radio for his decades of effort and work on the DocuFunk archive. And finally this week, radio station WBZ in Boston is celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2021. It is the oldest broadcast station in New England and one of the oldest stations in the United States. The Bellarica Amateur Radio Society, along with the Hamden County Radio Association in Springfield, will be commemorating this anniversary by conducting a special operating event starting at 1300 UTC or 0900 AM Eastern Daylight Time, September 17th, and ending at 0359 UTC, September 20th. WBZ began operations on September 15, 1921, at the Westinghouse Works building on Page Boulevard in East Springfield, Massachusetts, broadcasting with just 100 watts. 
1931, Westinghouse moved the station to Boston. Its 15,000-watt transmitter was moved to Millis. By 1933, Westinghouse increased WBZ's power to 50,000 watts. In 1940, the transmitter was moved to Hull. The station was made famous with its slogan, The Spirit of New England. After World War I, wireless radio grew with an increase in ham radio operators. Amateurs greatly contributed to the advance of the radio arts. One of their contributions was the development of voice-modulated radio signals, which used amplitude modulation. WBZ first broadcast using amplitude modulation 100 years ago. For their efforts, amateurs were granted permanent privileges for frequencies in the 80, 40, 20, and 10-meter shortwave bands by the International Treaty in 1927. The partnership of commercial broadcasting and amateur radio hobbyists was very beneficial to all. Amateurs using the call signs W1W, W1B, W1Z, and WB1Z will make two-way contact with other amateurs across all bands on single sideband, AM, CW, and digital modes. A special QSL card will be sent to anyone who contacts one or more of the special event stations and sends a card accompanied by a self-addressed stamped envelope. The card will feature historical photos of WBZ over the years, as well as a special 100th anniversary WBZ logo. A historical sheet will also be available for download. If you are interested in operating one of the special stations, please contact Larry Cranson, W1AST, at WB1DBY at Comcast.net. The group is seeking New England operators only at this time. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the Internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w 2 xbs seven seven at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.